Excuse me, good sir. We're gonna have to make you lose for the sake of the plot. Okay. I like that idea. Sounds reasonable enough. But how about this? No. Well, good yes, sir. I guess there's nothing we can do about that. What's up, guys? I'm Alphonse here, and here we are to talk about whether or not the Gojo Sato has to lose for the plot, for the story to go on, all that good stuff. And, um, my conflicting ideas about it, all right? Let's just, let's be generous and call them conflicting. I'll admit, I ain't that conflicted, but let's say I'm conflicted. But let's hop right into it. What's up, guys? Like I'm here. Fun fact, I have it on me, and I keep it on me at all times. And fun fact, I still need to clean this. I need to, I need to clean you. Jeez. Jeez. I keep you on you too much. Can't keep it on you too much, but being keep it on you too much without cleaning. But regardless... Yes, we're going to talk about whether or not Gojo Satoru needs to lose for the plot's sake. And why I have iffy ideas about it. But first things first, let me talk about the side that I don't typically disagree with, but I do think has valid points. Why Gojo needs to lose in order for the plot to progress. Um, if you've been reading the same 13 chapters that I've read, currently at recording, the latest chapter is 235, you have been seeing um, the fact that Gojo Satoru is in fact, I think it's a three-letter word, that starts with an H and ends with an M. Yeah, Gojo Satoru's been pretty him. Like, literally wiping out his inverse built-in counter, fighting head-to-head -head with the King of Curses in the optimal body that the King of Curses actually sought out, literally going out of his way to hit four Black Flashes in short succession. Like, obviously, Gojo's been pretty him right? Like, it's hard to say he hasn't been. And thusly, there's a big issue that comes with Gojo being so himothy. Um, if he's so himothy that he is mollywhopping the King of Curses, as far as we know, the strongest member of the enemy side, then what do we do after Gojo wins? We do know for a fact that the series is going to continue after this fight. This series is not going to end once Sukuna or Gojo lands the final blow. The series does have to continue. And if the good guys have such an overwhelming, meaty, like smack it on the table kind of advantage, it's pretty much impossible to ignore in the strongest sorcerer. How can you really expect the plot to go on? Number two, it seems like a lot of people believe that Yuji is Sukuna's main target, or at least in terms of villain hero dynamics, Sukuna and Yuji line up a lot more than Gojo and Sukuna, and thusly it wouldn't be like thematically or character-wise satisfying for Gojo to beat Sukuna. So unfortunately, in order to fulfill the thematic role, Gojo's gonna have to go go. You know what I'm talking about? So he's gotta get up out of here so we can get that Yuji versus Sukuna fight. It's built into the narrative. That essentially has to happen, right? And of course, if Gojo beats Sukuna, we can't have that fight. Another character who is heavily built around Sukuna specifically is a certain Hajime Kashime. And by that, I mean Hajime Kashimo. Yeah, obviously. Kashimo 400 years ago was like, hey, yo, Kenny, let me know. Who you got as the strongest sorcerer in history? And Kenjago was like, you know, if you're asking me, I've been around for a minute now. It's Sukuna. You know, he got got about 600 years back, but my apologies, broski. My answer's not changing. And thus, Kashimo Hajime literally decided to incarnate, to land on the scene, and say, yo, bet. I'll reincarnate in this stupid little game of yours just so I can run the hands with Sakura. And he literally spent, from the moment he was introduced, all the way up through his fight with Akari, looking for that man Sakuna. So obviously, once again, if Gojo beats Sakuna, then Kashimo's never going to get the chance to show out. Because that's the main person he wanted to show out against. That's who Kenjaku, the most knowledgeable character in the verse, said was the strongest sorcerer. And sure, maybe... Kenjago could be wrong, but in Kashimo's mind, he literally reincarnated for this. He decided to live a whole second life because of this. He ran into a gambling man because of his want to fight specifically Sukuna, the strongest sorcerer. So that's Kashimo, another character that's built on this. And top this off with even more stuff. Once again, going back into Gojo's power thing, Kenjaku's not a threat. Like, sure, Kenjaku's a threat to literally the rest of the cast. Like, Kenjaku alone beat 
both a special grade sorcerer in Yuki Sakumo and also a special grade curse slash high grade one sorcerer in Choso alone in their territory when he couldn't use his domain properly because it got shut down. Yeah, obviously Kenjaku's a little bit of Hemothy, but with Gojo there, Kenjaku is essentially a joke, like legitimately. If you don't remember, go back to chapter 221 and see how Kenjaku was shaken in his boots. His timbers were in fact shivered the moment Sojo Satoru, Sojo Satoru, Gojo Satoru hopped out the box. It was simple as that. Kenjaku was like, wait, hey, yo, broski, <laughs> you know, I did a whole bunch of work to try to keep you in that box. And even if you did get out that box, I thought you were going to stay in the ocean in Paris. So how'd you get here, bro? You want to like, talk about it? Please, please keep me alive. You know, I've been cooking for a thousand years. Please don't cook me in near nearly got cooked. And then the final wall on some IQ from Blue Lock type beat, Sukuna himself came up and was like, whoa, 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 broski. You can't get rid of the big brain boy. I need that smoke. Like, I promise you, a couple hundred chapters back. So obviously, once again, in order for us to have a narrative continuation in the way that the narrative's currently set up, Kenjaku's not a threat if Gojo's around. Heck, even while he's brain damaged, just grew back an arm and lost in his own special little world, Gojo easily wipes Kenjaku. It's highly likely that even if Kenjaku were to drop his burialist domain on top of Gojo's head right now, or even a buried one, considering Gojo ate the strongest divine domain in the entire series, Mellow One Shrine, with some RCT and some determination, it is highly likely that whatever little gravity technique that Kenjaku tries to drop on Gojo's head, combined with who knows how many cursed spirits, would literally all get bulldozed through by a casual hollow purple that would eviscerate Kenjaku. So ultimately, it's just not looking good for Gojo on the narrative front. If he wins, he takes too many fights away from other characters who are either nearly as important as he is in the case of... Yeah, it's kind of a lot. Kajimo's like nowhere near the importance of Gojo. But still, a very important and popular character like Kashiko takes away his major fight takes away the most major fight of the main character Yuji Tadori. don't let Gege fool you just because he forgot to draw him does not mean that Yuji's not the main character and also it ends up pretty much stagnating and chopping the plot in half to the point where the plot literally can't continue because the main villain gets fodderized by Gojo Satoru while Gojo Satoru is in arguably one of the weakest states we've seen in the entire series with no access to domain. So obviously this is just cold hard facts that Gojo Satoru needs to lose for the plot. Like I'm sorry all the Gojo fans out there you know we tried our best we really fought the good fight but it just has to happen for plot's sake. There's just absolutely nothing. Okay, obviously, I don't actually believe that. So let's take this piece by piece and why I kind of disagree with that metric. And I actually kind of see the opposite. I see Gojo kind of has to win for plot, but lose in a different sort of way. So first things first, Kashimo. I'm going to pull out the Kashimo fans' arguments here. Kashimo does not care about fighting Sukuna specifically. He incarnated and promised to save his curse technique for the strongest the maviest, the meatiest sorcerer that he could ever run into. And he is currently sitting back... Post it up like this, lob it in the cut, telling you to sit his little behind down, because he's got next. Notably, he didn't say, well, admittedly, he did say, I got next. He did say, he did say to Akari, hey, yo, don't hold me back. If Gojo falls, I'm hopping in next. He did say that, but recently, his most recent statement of hopping in next in 234 was specifically to Yuta being like, hey, yo, broski, sit your behind down. I don't know where you think you're going, but... You ain't doing this. I got next. So he 100% sees the vision. Kajimo sees the vision that Sakuda could lose. It's a possibility, and he's just ready to fight Gojo. And honestly, I think that'd be an even more interesting fight. Even actually, that's kind of a lie. Does Kajimo have any way to get past Infinity? I don't know. He better have learned domain amplification or something. But regardless, Kashimo is not specifically locked in fighting Sukuna. He wants to fight the strongest. If he was so locked on fighting Sakuna, he would not have even let Gojo fight first. Hey, let's be real. If Kashimo was all the way about that action and really wanted to fight specifically Sukuna, he would not want to fight Sukuna on weakened terms. He would not want to fight Sukuna second. He wouldn't want next. He'd want first. He would not want to be the person that's going to hop on the sticks. He would grab the sticks out of your hands and say, nah. I'm playing Pikachu, round start, and I'm beating all y'all in 8-player Smash. So obviously, Kashimo is more than willing to be just a teeny tiny bit flexible. He does not need to fight Sukuna specifically, so taking Kashimo's angle out of the narrative, 
He's got no necessary need for Gojo to lose for Kashima's sake. For Itadori's sake, remember, Itadori is the main character. Sukuna is not the main villain. Now, <laughs> I made a whole video discussing this. So if you want my super duper crazy in-depth thoughts on why I believe that Sukuna is not the main villain, go over to that video. It will either be linked in the card or somewhere. It's going to be linked somewhere. But with that being the case, we got to remember, Sukuna would not exist just as Itadori would not exist in this current situation without a certain big brain boy. Ken Jaku. And thusly, considering the fact that Kenjaku has not appeared in 13 chapters, whenever Kenjaku disappears for a long span within the narrative, it's likely he's cooking something. I would say that the main villain status actually does not fall to Sukuna. It falls to Kenjaku as the orchestrator of the entire narrative up to this point. Even though Kenjaku is definitively, don't get me wrong, you will never, and I mean never, hear me arguing that Kenjaku even stands a chance of beating Sukuna in a fist fight or any sort of fight. Outside of mental one, maybe. I'm fortunately just gonna say the truth. Hojo is a side character. And Sukuna is a side villain. Are they both major side characters and a major side villain? Yes, but that does not give them precedent to suddenly be the main ones. Did Gojo get an entire arc? Yes. Is Sukuna set up as the strongest member of the villain side? Yes. Does either of that really matter in terms of their respective narrative roles? Not really. Sure, this battle is indubitably one of the most important and will set the foundations of the series going forward. However, in terms of it being the main final big bad battle between the main characters, this is just not it. It is not it at all. Nowhere near it. Well, not nowhere. It's pretty close. It's pretty close. But not to the degree that like, oh, well, Gojo has to lose because he's fighting the main villain and he's just a side character. They are both side characters, unfortunately. As much as I love Sukuna, as much as I love Gojo, I I can't just ignore the fact that both fall lower in the general scale of main character and main villain relative to Sukuna. I can't say that's it, Sukuna. Relative to Itadori and Kenjaku. So in terms of the main villain against a side character thing, doesn't necessarily work out because Sukuna's not the main villain. Unfortunate. It'd be like that when it'd be like that sometimes. However, let's move on to the next thing. The thematic battle between Itadori and Sukuna. Sure, Itadori is the main character and Sukuna is not the main villain, but still, their battle has been built up not since chapter 100, not since chapter 50, not since chapter... Chapter 1! Arguably before. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But like literally chapter one, the moment Sukuna got up in Itadori's guts, quite literally, that fight was set up, right? Like it, it is to the point where it's pretty hard to argue that it'd be kind of wrong to let Itadori have one of his most important thematic battles stolen from him by another character, even if that character's name is Satoru Gojo. If only we had an example. You remember Mahito? Remember how Mahito was like Itadori's top op. Like like the top of ops. Like so top opulous that it almost made Sukuna look secondary. It was to the point where Mahito was the person, not Sukuna, the person to fully shatter Itadori. To the point where Toto had to come and pick his brother up off the ground and be like, bro, you gotta keep moving forward. Never back down, never what? Never back down, never what? That's exactly what Toto had to come do for Itadori because Mahito broke that man so thoroughly. Mahito, another side villain. And um, you know what happened to Mahito? Right after Itadori had this big, meaty, duo, final, thematic, ultra-crazy battle where he developed a new understanding of himself and a different kind of feeling and respect towards Mahito, an understanding of their natures relative to each other as sorcerers and spirits, Itadori didn't get the kill. He did not get the dub. It was simply not in the cards for him. Never was, never will be. Because Mahito did not get taken out by Itadori. It was close. Very, very close. So close that you could almost taste the dub right there at the end of Shibuya. But ultimately, Itadori did not get the dub. The dub was never Itadori's to take. Because what ended up happening, Kenjaku 
the real main villain, came and slurped Mahito up and turned him into the plot device he was always meant to be. And thusly, it stands to reason that Sukun is pretty much in the exact same boat. To the point where, yes, is it super duper important that Itadori gets some, some sort of resolution with Sukuna? Absolutely. But it was also super duper important that Yuji got some sort of catharsis with Mahito. But Gege's already proven to us in explicit terms that he does not really care. <laughs> he will take away any catharsis for Yuji. The moment Yuji gets a tiny bit of catharsis, it's over. <laughs> It's over for me. Never last. It will never ever get close to lasting. And I don't see that changing even with Sakuna. Because ultimately, you gotta think about it. On a logical front. Does that really make sense for Itadori to beat Sakuna? But like in narrative, like like scaling wise, does it make sense? Obviously, I get the thematic parallels behind it, but not only do we have the example of Mahito, another extremely important thematic parallel for Yuji being stolen by Kenjaku, something I could see happening again to Sakuna. <coughs> but also, I mean, what way do you really want Yuji to beat Sakuna? What way do you really want it to happen? I know this is going to sound crazy, but the beat up, missing a hand, burnt like a crispy chicken nugget Sakuna that we see at the end of 235 would still mollywop you, Because that's still 20 finger Sakuna. Or 19 finger plus curse mummy. Itadori was not hanging with a fresh, cooked, <laughs> fresh out of the box Maguna who had his cursed energy output suppressed by Megami. Megami no longer an issue. It's just the case. That means that at any moment, Itadori pulls up them little cleaves, them little dismantles that Sakuna was throwing out against Yuji that he was eating at 15 finger. He ain't eating one of them at 20. He ain't. He is not. Simply not happening. And here's the thing. Even if we skip it, let's say that mystically, magically, Gojo does lose somehow. And Sakuna is down to like 1% of cursed energy. I still think Sukuna wins. I know that sounds crazy, but Sukuna is so insanely efficient that in, unless he's literally like laid out and Itadori gets the final punch, like <laughs> the thematic battle between Sukuna and Itadori just can't happen because Sukuna is way too strong for him. Literally, even on a spiritual level, like say Itadori, because I know a lot of people are assuming that maybe instead of an actual physical battle, since Sukuna is so much superior to Itadori, he would have a spiritual battle with him. Sukuna's soul at like one finger, or three, I forget when Mahito first encountered it, was so powerful that on its own, it casually wiped Mahito. You know, the thing that's the embodiment of all the hatred of humanity and thus has complete and absolute control over the soul, yeah, Sukuna's soul was exceptionally strong with one or three fingers. Now imagine it with like 19 of them, 20. Yeah, Isidori's still not winning that fight. So ultimately, not only does it not, and also just, I think, I'm not sure, but like, once again, Itadori, main character, Sakuna, side villain, Itadori's major final battle should be with Kenjaku, the person who stole all of Itadori's major thematic stuff and will likely steal Sakuna too. Thusly, all that in combination does not automatically relegate Sakuna to this safe pedestal where he is saved from Satoru giving him the most legendary back shots to the side of the Mississippi. And thusly, Sakuna kind of doesn't have a safety net or any reason for Gojo to automatically lose. But obviously, fine. You can take away Kashima. You can take away Itadori. You can take away all of that. But still, how do you expect a plot to progress if Gojo wins? Because... He absolutely mollywops Kenjaku. And trust me, I believe it. <laughs> like, I've, I've been flipping the script on all the previous points that I brought up so far, but no. Hands down. You could take off both of Gojo's arms, take one of his legs, take out three of his teeth, whip out one of the eyes, and shave half his head. And I still think he would absolutely mollywop Kenjaku. Probably one tap him. But even with that being said, I don't think Gojo is going to very easily get access to Kenjaku. Nor do I think Kenjaku's foolish enough to actually try and engage in a head-to-head -head fight. And if he's ever forced to, remember, 
he has a little something in his back pocket that no one else fully understands or has access to. Remember, Gojo Satoru is as strong as he is because he can control his cursed energy. Because the cursed energy manipulation of the world is optimized by Tengen's barriers. And sure, Gojo has operated overseas before when the optimization is not as high. However, I doubt he has that much experience in the field of manipulating his cursed energy without Tengen support. And Kenjaku currently holds Tengen, and at any moment could make Tengen shut down all the special totems that they have set up in order to reinforce cursed energy, essentially forcing Gojo into a situation where he has to relearn or readapt to cursed energy from ground zero. Thusly, Kenny essentially has an off switch to Gojo the moment he beats Sukuna. He does not actually have to deal with him. At least in the conventional sense that makes Gojo so overwhelmingly powerful, he has an out. And also, once again, Kenjaku is extremely smart. And unfortunately, Gojo left Kenjaku with an entire month to plan, prepare, and analyze how, when, why, and where he could deal with Satoru Gojo. Considering Kenjaku was able to come up with a plan to deal with these six eyes before, I wouldn't be shocked if he had some sort of plan again. Especially considering the fact that Kenjaku has full needs to simply achieve his goal pretty much at any time through simply manipulating the Kogane to end the Culling Games and begin the merger. It's highly likely that the fight between Gojo and Kenjaku will not actually be a fight between Gojo and Kenjaku. It will be a fight between the Amalgamation and Gojo, or maybe the Amalgamation and Kenjaku against everyone, which is what I presumably assume it will be. Another thing about Gojo versus Kenjaku, very specifically, Gojo has had time to mellow out. He's had a whole month to cool his head. And as he admits, he wanted to properly mourn Geto's body. And thusly, him immediately eviscerating Kenjaku is very unlikely. Unfortunately, Gojo's still just a bit too human to do that. And thusly, I could see him slipping up and letting Kenjaku get exactly what he wants. But once again, this is all under the assumption that Gojo wins and Kenjaku just magically appears. Or Gojo magically teleports to him, which admittedly, he should be able to do. Like, like he teleported from the bottom of the ocean to where Kenjaku is. But still, if there's any singular character that I have faith with a month of prep time in JJK could cook up something to deal with Santuru Gojo, it would be Kenjaku. Would be Kenjaku. And finally, for the losing for the plot thing. Why well, I think it does not work within the scope of Gojo's character. There is the easy option, like Gay Gay literally wrote Gojo as the pinnacle of power within the verse, and thus him losing by anything other than like extremely underhanded tactics doesn't necessarily make sense within the context that Gay Gay built the character under. There's another thematic thing that goes with Gojo and his character outside of him simply being the strongest, despite that being what a lot of his character is about. That other thing is that Gojo typically always wins the battle, but he also tends to lose the war. So, what do I mean by this? For as early back in Gojo's timeline as the Gojo's past arc, Gojo won against Toji. He beat him, definitively. <laughs> you can ask the Apple logo. Who won the fight? Who won the rematch between Toji and... And Gojo, who's walking around living to tell the tale? It's Gojo. He won that fight. But what did he lose? What did he lose in that moment? He lost Rico, someone he had bonded with. And also, inadvertently, with some delay to it, he lost Suguru Geto, his best friend, and the only person he could ever hope to identify with, isolating Gojo at the peak due to the evolution of his power and the actions of Toji. So in the end, Toji Fushiguro did end up in the dirt. Probably not even in the dirt. I'm not sure what they did with his body. But he ended up cooked. And Gojo won. Not even won. Like, I, can't put ex I can't put quotation marks right. He won. He beat Toji. But he lost in the end. For Gojo versus Jogo in his... Well, actually, you could go to Gojo versus Sukuna. 
the first round when it was One Finger Sakuna versus Gojo. And Gojo won that fight, but he lost in the long term because that ended up way down the line, immediately. <laughs> Super Omega down the line. Ended up with Gojo losing his son to the King of Curses. Because he beat Sakuna then. But guess what? Now Sakuna's in Megami's body. And that wouldn't have happened if Gojo simply executed Yuji Tadori, as many people were asking him to. But he won that fight, but he ended up losing in the long run. For Gojo versus Jogo, he definitely won that fight. Who ended up headless? Who ended up headless by the end of that fight? Yeah. Yeah. It was Jogo. Did Gojo get any extra information that he wanted to get from that fight? Nope. Didn't get anything. Hanami saved Jogo and he essentially got away with nothing. For the Goodwill event, did Gojo absolutely come in in style all over the Hangar Man? Absolutely. Did he nearly wipe Hanami from existence? Indubitably. But he also still had like no information on what was going on. Like he lost all that info. Because the guy automatically perished, the Hangar Man, and Hanami escaped. So once again, he won the fight. Definitively, absolutely, as the pinnacle of the verse should, but he still lost the war. And ultimately, even when you get to Shibuya, oh, Gojo won. Gojo won. Atrociously. He demolished all the disaster curses, erased Hanami from existence, and proceeded to dominate the numerous transfigured humans that were in there, along with the disaster curses, with the awakening of a 0.2 second domain. But, once again, he lost massively. Getting sealed in the prison realm, losing Nanami, losing Nobara. For now, we'll talk about Nobara in our own video in a bit. Losing everything. And losing himself to Kenjaku, which ended up leading to the suffering of everyone he knew and everyone he cared about in one way or another. And even then, there was a fight that he technically won, but ended up losing in the long run. And going back in time to JJK Zero, he won against Miguel. Beat him so bad he became Yuta's teacher. But what did Gojo lose? He permanently lost his best friend, Suzuru Geto. At least when he lost him in the Gojo's past arc, he could see him. He was still alive. He was still a menace, causing threats, of course. But still, Gojo still had Geto. But a JJK Zero. Upon winning the fight against Miguel, and happily allowing Yuta to win against Ghetto, he lost Ghetto forever. So, Gojo's had this continuous through line of winning the battle, but losing the war. It's a pretty integral part of his character. It's one of the main reasons why Gojo is such a tragic character. All the power in the world. Power that so many people would covet. Power that Ghetto coveted, that Kenjaku coveted, that's, well, maybe not Sakuma. But numerous characters just call him the strongest, and he is. Gege conceived the character as the strongest, but the biggest thing that feeds into the idea that Gojo cannot lose the Sakuna for plot for me is the idea that even if he wins, even once he does win against Sukuna, say he wipes Sukuna from existence with another purple, say he hits, let's say his domain is back, his brain is fully healed off the four black flashes, the RCT's fully done, enough time has passed, he opens another domain and he absolutely wipes Maguna out of existence. He, like, turn his head off or something. And guess what he loses? His son. Gojo came to the battle with the objective of saving Megami. But... Being real with you, even if Gojo's won right now, like Kusakabe claims at the end of 235, guess what? Megami's cooked. His soul has been taking in numerous, and I mean numerous, unlimited voids. For who knows how long. Was it three minutes in order? Like, Megami's gone. Gone, gone. Even if the body's still intact, Megami's cooked. At best, he may regain consciousness after years. And I mean years of rehab and recovery. And he's cooked. Gojo's only son. The son that he took from a man he slayed over a decade ago is now cooked. Because Gojo won and will win against Sukuna.
He will win the physical battle, but ultimately, he will lose the one thing he came to the battle for, which was to save Megami. And that's the biggest reason, right? Because if we're talking about thematics, we're talking about plot, if we're talking about character writing, character interactions, and how these things feed into each other, we're going to have to look at the continuous narrative of these characters. And it is built within, it is hook, line, and sinker locked in to the character of Gojo Satoru, that every time he wins, he shall lose massively. Just because he has all the power in the world does not mean that he can gain everything within the world. The world will operate opposite to him. So every time he succeeds, he shall fail. And ultimately, I see this victory against Sakuna as one that is assured. He's the strongest, after all. He's going to win, but he will lose. The one thing he came to that fight for. And of course... No matter what, even if he does go on to absolutely one-tap Kenjaku in the most generous scenario possible, guess what he loses? Guess what he has to do all over again? He has to slay his best friend's body all over again. He has to lose any hope of Ghetto coming back by getting rid of the threat that is Kenjaku. So no matter what, Gojo will win. But in the end, no matter what, Gojo will lose. So, that's what I think. Please see what you guys think in the comment section down below. Do you guys think I'm crazy? Do you think that, no, regardless, no matter whatever, thematic stuff, character weight stuff, main character, side character, all that nonsense I talked about, do you guys still think, ah, I'm sorry, bro, <laughs> that was a lot of yapping, Sakuna still got to win for plot? Or do you guys agree with me? Do you think that the narrative through line, the alterations of characters, the pre-establishment of certain things, such as scaling or character writing or character parallels, along with the main villain, main hero, character dynamic stuff, do you think all that is true? Do you think Gojo does not have to lose for plot? Please let me know all that and more in the comment section down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And make sure that the notification bell so you do not miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do have a picture down below. Each one for as well as one. Cut them one. Dama. You can link exclusive videos, early content, and more. You also now become a member of the channel for as well as $3 a month to get the same perks and more. Now, thank you guys so much for watching once again. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is That Girl the Pencil, writing off. I'd like to give a thank you to our three dollar members, Recliner Plays and Red Bull Four Seven Six Five. I'd like to give a very big thank you to our five dollar patrons, Sean, Red Bull Four Seven Six Five, Midnight Gem Lord, Kevin, and Demex LND. I'd like to give a very big thank you to our ten dollar patrons, Rob Uchia and Idem Okami. I'd like to give another very big thank you to our twenty five dollar member, Alex Ice Rose, and a very big thank you to our twenty five dollar patron, Igneo.